Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar presented by the Insurance Defense and Alternative Dispute Resolution Group at Kelly Santini. We're uh, glad you could join us, uh, spend a bit of your afternoon with us. Before I turn things over to Steve for his presentation today on the mysteries of the property appraisal process, just a couple of quick, uh, quick housekeeping items. First off, if you have any questions, uh, we have reserved time at the end of the presentation to uh, take those questions. You can submit those questions using the control panel, uh, which is um, hopefully readily available to you. The first question we always get is, can we get a copy of the slides? Uh, the sh short answer is, of course, yes. Uh, we will email everyone attending today, uh, uh, later this afternoon, a copy of the slides. They are also available through the control panel in the handout section if you want to download a copy of the slides right, uh, right away. Our presenter today is Stephen Kelly of Kelly Santini LLP in Ottawa. Over the course of his 36 year career as a litigator, Steve Kelly's focused on insurance defense, uh, representing Canadian and international insurers and municipalities on a wide range of claims, including property damage claims. And Steve is, the, is a past chair of the Risk Management Council of Canada. Steve's practice expanded in 1992 when he became a mediator and arbitrator. And today his practice is solely focused on alternative dispute resolution. Steve is a chartered arbitrator and chartered mediator with the ADR Institute of Canada. He is also a chartered member of the Canadian Academy of Distinguished Neutrals. Steve, Steve has been a member of the panel of arbitrators with Tarion's Builders Arbitration Forum since its, since its inception. And for six years, Steve was a part-time vice chair of the License Appeal Tribunal, hearing many claims by homeowners under the, new, uh, under the Ontario New Home Warranty Plan Act. Steve has conducted private arbitrations dealing with issues such as commercial rent, construction projects, disputes involving municipalities, green energy products, and condominium development projects, uh, conflicts. And finally, and most importantly for today's proceedings, Steve acts as an umpire in appraisal proceedings pursuant to section 128 of the Ontario Insurance Act. So with that introduction, I will turn things over to Steve. Uh, please do send in those questions as they occur to you, and uh, we will uh, take those questions at the end. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Keith, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. It was nice to see some familiar names on the list of attendees. It was also nice to see that we have people from across the country attending today. Um, I'm a real uh, promoter of the property appraisal process. To me, it makes sense to determine property damages outside of the court system. The invitation that you were sent uh, referenced mysteries of the appraisal process. That is because the Insurance Act actually provides very little direction. Uh, recently, I received a few calls from people in the insurance industry asking me to explain the appraisal system to them which made me think it might be helpful to have a seminar, the goal of which is to provide everyone with a better understanding of the basics. So that's what we're, I'm gonna to try to do today. Next slide, please, Keith. So this is the uh, roadmap for my uh, talk today. I like to uh, hope to address each of these items. Next slide, Keith. It is the wild west out there in the property appraisal world. There are very few rules and very little structure. The few rules there are, are start with section 148 of the Insurance Act, uh, which sets out the statutory conditions, including statutory condition 11, which is the one we're concerned with. And it is up on your screen now. I'll give you a moment to read that. As you'll see, it refers to a disagreement as to value and says that when there is a disagreement as to value, the value will be determined by an appraisal process under the Insurance Act. I can tell you that the findings of the appraisal process are binding and there is no right of appeal. There is a right of judicial review based on allegations of bias or lack of procedural fairness. Um, but uh, there is no statutory right to appeal just because you're unhappy with the decision 
or the reasons for the decision. The jurisdiction of the appraisal panel is very limited. The job of the panel is to determine the value of the damages, of the property damaged. That's it. We don't deal with things such as the, interpreting the policy. We don't deal with things such as who actually owns the property. That is all left to the courts. The appraisal panel merely deals with damages. Next slide, please, Keith. Section 148 uh, also sets out two preconditions. The first is that one of the parties, either the insurer or the insured, must request an appraisal in writing. And the second precondition is that a proof of loss will have had to been delivered by the insured. Once those two preconditions are satisfied, you can proceed with the appraisal. The appraisal is set out, process is set out in section 128 of the Act. Next um, slide, please, Keith. Now, I say the appraisal process is set out in the Act. Well, I, I say that it, it is sort of set out in the Act. It's very sparse. Subsection 1, which I haven't uh, provided to you, merely says that the section applies to contracts containing a condition calling for an appraisal. Subsection 2, which you can see in your screen, says the insured and the insurer shall each appoint an appraiser, and the two appraisers so appointed shall appoint an umpire. So that's how the panel is uh, assigned or is created. Subsection 5 of Section 128 goes on to say that the parties have to appoint point their appraiser within seven days of the demand for the appraisal. And after the appraisers have been appointed, they have 15 days to agree on an umpire. Now, those are short timelines, seven days and 15 days. And the reason is that the legislature wants this process to move promptly. They don't want it to drag like the court system does. If there is a default in appointing an appraiser or an umpire, then there is a provision in subsection five to bring an application to the court to have the court appoint the umpire or appraiser. Next slide, please, Keith. Now, what are an appraiser's duties? Well, those are set out in section 128 sub three. And it's fairly simple. The appraisers shall determine the matters in disagreement. And if they fail to agree, they shall submit their differences to the umpire and the finding in writing of any two determines the matter. So you can see we have a two-step process. First step is the appraisers get together and they try to determine the value of the damaged goods. If they are successful, then that, that is it, that decision's been made. If they're unsuccessful, then they bring in the umpire and the umpire and any one of the appraisers can come to an agreement as to the value of the damaged goods, and that will uh, determine the, the, the value final. Uh, an example might be of assistance. If we assume there's been a fire and there's a dispute as to the value of the contents, and we'll say there are 100 items in the contents, so, although typically there are hundreds, if not thousands of items. So the attempt, the appraisers got together and they reached agreement on 95 items. There, uh, but five remained outstanding. So they bring in the umpire to help them determine the value of the, those five uh, damaged items. Now the act says that the, the differences are submitted to the umpire, which suggests that it, the decision is turned over to the umpire and that the umpire is the sole decision maker. That's not the case. The umpire is not an, uh, an arbitrator. The umpire is best looked at as a tiebreaker. If the umpire and one appraiser agree on the value, then that determines the issue. Now, that is all the, there is in the way of structure and guidance on process provided by the Insurance Act. There is nothing about who can be an umpire or an appraiser. There's nothing about who determines the process that will be followed. 
There is no requirement that the appraisers are to meet. There's no requirement that the appraisers are to examine the property. There, uh, an appraisal hearing is not required, uh, a hearing between the appraisers and the umpire. And there's nothing that says that anyone has to speak with the homeowners or the insurer. It's a complete vacuum. Next slide, please, Keith. The Insurance Act, Section 128, does deal with the matter of costs. In subsection 4, it specifies that each party pays their own appraiser. Each party pays half of the umpire's fee. And each party pays half of the costs associated with the appraisal. In the pre-COVID days, that would be a room rental. At this point, it might be helpful to consider the aim of the appraisal process. Next slide, please, Keith. Now, this statement is taken from a number of court decisions in Ontario, from across Canada and the United States. And it, the appraisal process is an efficient and cost-saving measure to effectively resolve a dispute as to value using the expertise of the appraisers and umpire. So that's the goal. That's the purpose of the uh, property appraisal process. You may wonder why the legislature took this issue away from the courts and assigned it to an appraisal panel. And the reason is the courts want nothing to do with this, with this topic. Judges don't have the expertise to determine um, the, the value of uh, damage to property. They must rely on witnesses. They typically hear from the homeowners and expert witnesses. Hearing from witnesses, them being examined and cross-examined, qualified as experts, it is all very time consuming and trials grind away slowly. It is a very expensive exercise for the parties. It also ties up court time and helps contribute to the backlogs in the court system. So with the, I'm sure with the applause of the judges, the legislature turned to the appraisal process to come up with final binding valuations. And I can also tell you that the courts are not anxious to in any way to uh, recover any of this lost jurisdiction. So who can be an appraiser? Next slide, please, Keith. Well, almost anyone. I love that, hands up, pick me, pick me. The Insurance Act doesn't provide a definition of who is an appraiser or set out any qualifications. Prior versions of the Ontario legislation referenced that appraisers must be disinterested. But that provision was removed from subsequent versions of the legislation. Some will say that it was removed because it was uh, obvious that an appraiser would have to be disinterested. Others would say it was taken out because appraisers can be advocates. In other provinces and states, their legislation continues to include the term disinterested and requires that appraisers be disinterested parties, but not Ontario. The courts have attempted to clarify who can be an appraiser. In the Ontario decision of Greer and cooperators, the court found that an appraiser must have expertise in property value and the appraiser must be competent. But who determines if an appraiser is competent? Is it the umpire? Well, there's no authority in the act for the umpire to exercise judgment as to uh, whether an individual is appointed as an appraiser is competent or not. In the Ontario case of Matahani and Wawanisa, the court found that appraisers were decision makers, either together, the two appraisers, or one of them with an umpire. And that procedural fairness requires that decision makers be impartial. In the case of Newfoundland Telephone Company and Newfoundland, the court determined that an appraisal panel is an administrative board and that it has decision-making powers. As a result, the court found that the board members have to be impartial. 
and awards under um, the property appraisal regime have been challenged for lack of bias on the part of the panel members. Courts often look to dictionaries for uh, assistance, so I thought it would be helpful if we look for dictionaries, uh, dictionaries as well. <clears throat> so we have Black's Law Dictionary's definition of appraisal. <clears throat> you see that I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, you see that I've highlighted there the word disinterested. And then we have Black Law, Black's Law Dictionary's definition of the term appraiser and I've highlighted impartial. So based on the case law and these dictionary definitions, I think we know at least that appraisers must be impartial and have some expertise as to property value. Or do we? Next slide, please, Keith. We have the recent decision uh, from the Superior Court of Ontario in Campbell and Desjardins, a 2020 decision uh, by Justice Smith. Uh, this came out of Ottawa. And uh, full disclosure here, um, one of my partners represented one of the insurers in these, this application. And a brief summary of the facts, um, there were a number of homes were damaged by tornadoes that went through Eastern Ontario in uh, 2018. And the insurer requested an, an appraisal uh, in dealing with a uh, number of the homeowner's claims. Now the insurer appointed in -house, an in-house adjuster to be their appraiser. The homeowners all had the same plaintiff's counsel and one homeowner had already commenced a bad faith claim against the insurer using that counsel. And the homeowners named their plaintiff's counsel as their appraiser. Now, the umpire determined that the appraisers lacked impartiality. He saw them as advocates. And he refused to proceed until the parties named new appraisers. The insurer appointed an outside adjuster as its appraiser. But the homeowners refused to name a new appraiser, insisting that their counsel proceed. The insurers brought an application uh, to the court for an order in part that uh, the homeowners appoint a new appraiser. And Justice Smith made a number of findings, including that appraisers can be advocates, that there is no need for appraisers to be impartial or independent. He didn't recognize appraisers as decision makers. He saw the umpire as being the decision maker, and he allowed insurance counsel to remain as the uh, homeowner's appraiser. Now, this is a marked departure from previous cases, but the Court of Appeal really hasn't spoken on this issue yet, um, and the case is under appeal, but until we hear from the Court of Appeal, there's uncertainty as to who can be an appraiser. I'm hoping that the Court of Appeal takes this opportunity to do an overview of the appraisal process uh, and fill in some of the blanks or direct uh, the legislature to address some of the uh, items it identifies as lacking. But if the court only deals with who can be appraiser, uh, it can still have a, a significant impact. If the court says that an appraiser must be in, independent and cannot be an advocate, well, that's going to change things. Insurance companies won't be able to appoint in-house adjusters as their appraisers. Uh, they may try to appoint independent outside adjusters, but the question will arise is really how independent is that outside adjuster? If there is substantial workflow from the insurance company to that adjuster, they may well not be seen to be impartial or independent. And I would think clearly plaintiff's counsel, who is an advocate by definition, will not be seen to be uh, impartial and um, will not be al allowed to be uh, act as an appraiser. Next slide, please, Keith. Um, 
here are a list of uh, individuals who have been uh, appointed as appraisers in the past. Insureds uh, often name themselves as, uh, as their own appraisers. Probably not a, a wise move, but it happens. They appoint lawyers, they retain public adjusters, and they retain experts such as engineers, architects, and, and contractors. Insurers, as indicated, uh, often appoint in-house adjusters, independent uh, third-party adjusters, or experts. I can tell you that I've worked um, with uh, lawyers uh, representing insureds, uh, insureds representing themselves, in-house counsel, in-house adjusters representing insurers, and, uh, and third-party adjusters representing insurers. And uh, they've all worked out. Um, we've always been able to achieve our goal. Um, personally, though, uh, I believe the intention of the legislature is that two knowledgeable, independent appraisers be appointed, and that those two work together in good faith to determine the value of the damaged property. But for now, it stands that almost anyone can be an appraiser. Next slide, please, Keith. Um, so now, who can be an umpire? Well, again, the Act doesn't provide a definition or any uh, specify any requirements. Uh, we do know that the umpire has to be selected by the two appraisers. If not, one will be assigned by the court. The umpire is certainly a decision maker, one of them, and so he or she must be neutral, impartial, and independent. And I submit they should also be knowledgeable. Now, it isn't necessary that the, an umpire be a lawyer, an arbitrator, or a mediator, but um, people from each of those roles uh, would have something to contribute to the role of, of umpire. A lawyer with knowledge should have knowledge of the rules of civil procedure, should be experienced in interpreting legislation and policies, and may have a background in construction litigation. An arbitrator uh, would have experience in establishing process, in making and writing decisions. And a mediator would have experience in working together and encouraging others to work together in a common goal. So I think it can be said that a lawyer experienced in, who is an experienced litigator, arbitrator, and mediator in construction disputes would be well suited to act as an umpire. Now you may have noticed I've described myself there, which will be the first and last blatant self-promotion in this uh, seminar. My apologies, couldn't resist. Next slide, please. Now, what authority does an umpire have? Well, first of all, they are not an arbitrator. An arbitrator through legislation, through the arbitration house rules, and through the arbitration agreement has jurisdiction to determine its own uh, jurisdiction, uh, has jurisdiction to uh, set the process, to establish a process, and has the authority to make the ultimate decision. Uh, the umpire is not the sole decision maker, despite Justice Smith's finding in Campbell. The umpire is part of a team that can help determine the damages. The umpire has no statutory authority to determine the process or make any rulings regarding the process. That said, my experience is that appraisers generally look to the umpire to establish the process. And one uh, advantage of operating in a vacuum uh, created by the Insurance Act is that the panel, and again, most often the umpire, can be creative in establishing the process. But in doing so, they must abide by the rules of procedural fairness. Now, I've referred to the rules of procedural fairness a number of times and uh, simply said they are the right to be heard, for each party to be heard, 
the right to have an impartial adjudicator and that the decision be an informed decision, that it be made based on the information, not um, based on any loyalty of one party or the other. Now, I thought it might be helpful to set out for you the process that I generally follow. And I, I point out that um, I don't follow the same process in absolutely every case. It depends on the circumstances. I can also tell you that I've spoken with other uh, umpires and they, they follow a similar process, not always the same. Uh, some are structured more like arbitrations. But um, this is my process. When I'm first approached to be appointed, I do a conflict check. Provided that clears, I draft a document entitled Acceptance of Appointment. And it contains and it, it identifies the parties and the property involved in the dispute. It identifies the appraisers and the umpire. It identifies the property for which the value is to be determined. It sets out my rates. It also sets out my role and includes that I will preside over meetings and I will issue directions on process. And it also contains a confirmation that the mandate of the tribunal is to act in a timely, fair, and cost-effective manner. So it is those two provisions that uh, say that I will preside over meetings and I will issue directions on process that give me the authority to do so. Absent that, those provisions in the agreement, I would be in, have no more authority than would the appraisers to determine uh, process and uh, to preside over meetings. Uh, this document is sent, uh, is signed by the insurer and the insured because it is those two parties that are footing the bill. And I'll send you a copy of the draft agreement uh, when we send you the, uh, the slides for this presentation. Next um, slide, please, Keith. Once I get the signed acceptance of appointment back, I'll set up initial conference call with the two appraisers and myself. And the purpose of the conference call is to establish a timetable. And the number one item on the timetable, or the first item on the timetable, is to specify that the appraisers are to attempt to resolve the dispute together. And we set out a time frame for them to do that. Um, we also schedule production of a joint book of documents. Now, generally the appraisers, when they are trying to resolve the matter uh, amongst themselves, they get access to, the, to their clients' files and obtain and share the material from the files, including expert reports. And they'll also do a site review uh, or may do a site review and they may uh, check out and examine the documents, these sort of the contents that are in storage. And generally they will meet in person or these days on Zoom to try to resolve it. Um, but I'm not part of all that. So I look to them to provide me with a joint book of documents. Uh, I emphasize that it's limited to documents relating to the items that are outstanding. I don't need documents relating to items that the appraisers have resolved already. And I also limit it to the essential documents. I don't need every scrap of paper that uh, is on the file. This is consistent with our goal to be effective and timely. And the joint books of, of documents are now electronic. Uh, I've done away with paper and most everybody else has. We, uh, we ask for the production books to be in uh, electronic format, searchable PDFs, and bookmark. And this is uh, just way more efficient. The appraisers don't always agree on what documents should go in the book of uh, doc the joint book of documents. So I specify a time for them to provide any additional documents in a supplemental book of documents that they feel that uh, uh, the tribunal should be viewing. And uh, at the same time they deliver the supplemental book of documents, I ask them to 
uh, provide a narrative limited at 10 pages, double spaced, which in which they're to set out their views <clears throat> on the, the value of the um, remaining items in dispute and uh, why they uh, are why they have come to that opinion. We also schedule timing for providing any additional expert reports. Now, typically, the insured and insurer already have experts retained, but sometimes the appraiser decides that it would be helpful for the um, for the appraisal panel to uh, have the opinion of another expert. And so we schedule the time for those reports to be provided. We also schedule a file management conference. That'll be an opportunity for us to get together about a week before the um, appraisal meeting. And I'll address that in more detail momentarily. Actually, why don't I do it now? So, oh no, I'll, go, I'll go back, follow my normal plan. Uh, so we'll uh, schedule the appraisal meeting and uh, and the appraisal meeting varies in length. It can be in a day, it can be several days to a week, um, but I can assure you it is always a much shorter time frame than would be uh, required in court. We also schedule a possible uh, viewing of the site uh, and uh, if necessary, a viewing of the contents and storage. So that's the timetable. And it stretches out over a matter of a few months to maybe up to up to six months at the most. Um, and it's certainly not a matter of years like the courts. Now I mentioned the file management meeting. Again, this is um, about a week before the appraisal meeting, and it's really a, a housekeeping function. Um, it's a chance for the uh, appraisers to tell me what items they've addressed and, uh, and agreed upon already and what remains outstanding. I also ask them to update me on the status of the settlement discussions. Where are they and uh, how far apart are they? Um, I ask uh, if they haven't already. Typically, one of the appraisers uh, has developed an Excel spreadsheet, but if you haven't, I ask one of them to do that. Um, it identifies the property and provides particulars such as the date of purchase, purchase price, that sort of thing. Um, I ask each of the appraisers to indicate who will they uh, be calling to speak to us, uh, who uh, witnesses, uh, in, in, there would be witnesses in court, but this isn't a trial, so um, they're just people coming to speak to us to inform us. So I'll ask uh, who, who are they going to call and why? And, and we'll chat about whether it's really necessary to hear the, from those people uh, with a view of keeping costs down. We'll have to determine how long each of these speakers will uh, uh, be speaking with us so that we can establish an order of witnesses. So by the end of the um, file management meeting, we should be all set for the appraisal meeting itself. Next slide, please, Keith. So the appraisal meeting involves both appraisers and myself. Um, I usually started off by attempting to mediate a settlement between the two appraisers. If we can establish a settlement through mediation, we can avoid several, uh, the cost of several days, if not more, of the appraisal meeting. And that'll be a significant cost savings to the parties. Uh, I recently had a, um, an appraisal meeting that uh, when we got there, uh, I asked them how far apart they were, and they were $7,500 apart, two appraisers. But they just couldn't, between themselves, move any closer. And we were looking at two days of uh, hearing from a number of experts, uh, and also my time and their own time, and it made no sense to incur those type of costs over $7,500. So we, uh, I mediated, took a mediator's approach to that and we resolved it within a few hours and avoided all those costs. When uh, working with the appraisals uh, in the mediation phase, I'm more opinionated than I am in a typical mediation. 
I tell them where I'm leaning and why. Uh, we'll, we will examine bids and quotes and assessments and discuss the strengths and weaknesses of each. Uh, we usually have a respectful exchange of our thoughts and views, and we search for an opportunity for the appraisers to uh, reach agreement and to resolve either all or some of the remaining items. If we can't re reach agreement on all items, then we'll proceed with the appraisal meeting. Again, it's not a hearing, so I don't typically have the speaker sworn. Uh, I, I'm speculative as to the um, um, the effectiveness of oaths in any event. People are either going to tell you the truth or lie, whether or not they have a swear an oath or not. But uh, this isn't a hearing, so we don't have uh, the speakers swear an oath. There's also that it's not recorded and there's no transcript. Generally, we will hear from the homeowners, the contractors who submitted bids, and other experts who provided assessments. I'll invite the appraiser uh, who is calling the speaker to lead the discussion with that uh, speaker. Um, the other appraiser and, and the umpire, being myself, will ask questions, will discuss uh, items, uh, issues with the speaker. It's a much less adversarial process than the litigation process, yet the speakers are challenged. Uh, we'll take them up on points that uh, we think their their opinion is questionable or their uh, if their bid is uh, missing items, that sort of thing. But they're not grilled as they are would be on the stand in a court case. When the speaker's finished, even if it's the homeowners, they leave. The only ones who remain uh, in the uh, appraisal meeting for the duration are the two appraisers and the umpire. Typically, after each speaker, I stop and check to see if there's an opening to arrive at a settlement at that point. Can we arrive at an agreement on a value based on what we've heard from the, the speaker? Or if not, do we need to hear from uh, uh, subsequent speakers. So with each speaker, we'll stop and check and try to come up with a resolution. But if necessary, we'll we'll go to the, through the whole list of speakers. Um, once we've heard from all the uh, speakers uh, and we're back alone ourselves, the two appraisers and the umpire, uh, I'll ask to hear from the appraisers. I'll ask them to confirm what their positions are uh, and their numbers are. I'll advise them of my assessment and, and provide brief reasons for that. I'll invite them to agree with my number. They may do so. All I need is for one of them to agree with my number. Uh, if they won't, I may have to move towards their number. There will be some negotiation. And again, it just takes two of us to come up with an agreement uh, on the value. And ultimately, we will determine the value of all the, the disputed items. All right, once we've done that, um, and I, let me tell you just a bit about the atmosphere. My experience is that this negotiation process, this, 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 this decision process, is generally very amicable. There can be disagreements, and the odd time there's a bit of a flare-up of temper or disapproval, but it doesn't last. It's very uh, uh, collegial. Uh, professional and productive, and uh, I, I enjoy it. And I think that most of the uh, appraisers involved also enjoy the experience. But once we come to a final decision, uh, Section 128 requires the uh, decision to be placed in writing. So if we can go to the next uh, slide, Keith. So the decision is uh, put in the form of an award. And again, I'll provide you with a precedent uh, award when we send out the uh, PowerPoint presentation as well. But it's divided into section. The, we have the, the preliminary matters where the award identifies the party, the property, and the policy involved. The award identifies the tribunal members, the appraisers, and the umpire. And then for each uh, property in dispute, we will set out our findings as to the value. 
For the dwellings, we provide the replacement cost and the actual cash value. For detached pro, uh, private structures, we provide replacement cost and actual cash value. For personal property, we do the same. Uh, and we generally have a schedule uh, in the form of an Excel spreadsheet setting out uh, each item of personal property and the finding of value for each of those. Um, we will set out the quantum of additional living expenses that uh, we determined uh, the homeowners are entitled to. Uh, if there is a claim for ongoing living expenses, we don't have the authority to determine the entitlement. That's left to the courts. But we generally determine a monthly amount for future entitlement if the court finds that there is entitlement. It's just, uh, we find, I, I found that that's within our jurisdiction and I think the courts would find it an assistance. You know, we've already dealt with the past living expenses. Why don't we deal with the future amount at least uh, so that the court doesn't have to you know, go through the same exercise. Next slide, Keith, please. Sometimes we provide, uh, put some specific um, uh, terms in the award. Uh, for example, the insurance companies frequently ask us to set out in the award that the, the insured acknowledge that advance, certain advance payments have been made the dates of the payments and the amounts paid. We'll do that. And uh, I will consider, and so will the appraisers, uh, putting in other provisions if they're, if they're helpful and they can be very quite varied, as long as they don't stay, stray out of our jurisdiction, which is to deal with value. Um, once I have drafted the award, I'll circulate it to the appraisers for their uh, feedback and hopefully, ultimately, their approval and then we sign it either in counterparts or electronically. Um, and then of course it is uh, circulated to the insured and the homeowners. So that's my way of doing things. Uh, it isn't the only way. It has proven successful. Uh, most often, uh, we come up with unanimous agreement on the value of the property. Very rare that it is only myself and one other uh, appraiser. And through the appraisal process, we're able to reach a reasonable finding as to the value of the damaged property. We do it faster and in a more cost-effective manner than do the courts. And with the damages issue resolved, and I think this is also something that the legislature had in mind, if you can get the issue of quantifying damages out of the way, then the remaining issues are far more likely to resolve. And you'll either be able to avoid litigation entirely, or if litigation has already commenced, they're probably going to be able to come up with a settlement and avoid the trial. So in that way, the appraisal process is a really productive system. I encourage uh, you to use it when you uh, have the opportunity. So that's what I've had to say. I hope you're now more informed about the appraisal process and uh, we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Steve. We invite everyone now to uh, submit any questions that you have uh, for Steve on the appraisal process using the control panel uh, box on your screen. Uh, actually, one question's come in already, uh, Steve. In your experience, do you umpire more disputes on issues of content, contents valuation or building damage valuation and repair method? Um, they generally go hand in hand, frankly. Um, if they're fighting over the cost of uh, reconstruction of the, of the home, they're usually fighting over contents as well. Um, the cost of uh, reconstruction of the home is obviously the much um, more significant um, dollar value involved. It's, it's the, you got the higher uh, um, damage figure for sure, uh, much higher than the contents, but the contents generally take much longer. And, and uh, they take up a lot of court time too when, when the court used to uh, uh, 
And if the parties don't request the appraisal process, it leaves the court dealing with this as part of the trial. And I know that judges uh, really are frustrated uh, taking up court time dealing with contents. So um, although the property damages, the real property damages, um, uh, the more uh, significant number, the contents uh, take up much more time. Is the repair method often uh, under under uh, dispute? I'm not sure what you mean by repair method. Um, the um, oh yeah, well, I, I, I suppose what you're getting at is can something be repaired or or is it a write off and uh, uh, and and should the home be taken down? And yes, that's that's not infrequently a, a, an issue for dispute. Uh, sometimes there's an argument of, you know, it's agreed that the structure has to come down, but the foundation can still, some feel it can still be reused and perhaps the, owner, the insurer feels that way, but the homeowner doesn't think so. Okay, thanks, Steve. A couple more questions uh, in here. Uh, have you ever had parties refuse to itemize differences prior to meeting, disagreeing with the, the whole of damages uh, being claimed? Um no <laughs> and i think that's what the um no uh, I, I, I assume the only reason i i say that is because um you know the the insured and the insurer have a vested interest in getting some things resolved if they can so it hasn't been my experience that everything has been on the table they, typically something has been agreed upon and often it's, uh, it may only be that additional living expenses are being paid, for example. Okay. Why can't an umpire not mandate a time frame for which payment must be made following an appraisal? Uh, and then in brackets, where there are no coverage issues. And the simple answer to that is it's not within our jurisdiction. Our jurisdiction is to determine the amount, the, the value of the damages, not uh, requiring payment of them. Okay, uh, can you use the process for business interruption losses? I'm not sure if that if that makes sense to you. I believe Maybe. you could, yes. Okay, um, one more question. What differences uh, do you find when dealing with an, uh, an appraiser who is adversarial as opposed to an appraiser who is impartial? Um, well, adversarial, uh, simply a little less collegial. Um, there's a bit of tension in the air, is, is my experience. Now, having said that, the two appraisers, before they get to me at the appraisal meeting, have already, have already been working together to come up with a, a resolution of, uh, of some of the issues, some of the items. And generally, they have come up with um, agreement on some of the items. Uh, it's rare that uh, the, the appraisers come to the appraisal meeting saying that they've been working at this and yet they've achieved nothing. Um, so they have, by the time they come to the appraisal meeting, have demonstrated an ability to work together, but there's still differences. And um, sometimes um, the differences can boil over and things can get a bit heated. But um, generally still, uh, while things may be a little bit more tense, it's still professional and courteous. And I, I would say that uh, it takes a little longer uh, when you have advocates involved because they're less inclined to, to uh, admit the obvious or give on a point or two until the other side does. And they're, all, they're each waiting for the other side to move first. And, and I guess, well, this is my, my, my follow-up question. Does that, does it also add to the, the length and cost of the process? If you have, you were given the, the example of a plaintiff counsel who is acting as an appraiser, but who likely wouldn't be an, an expert. Uh, so then they're having to bring in experts to provide their own opinions on, on some of the costs. Um, yes, uh, but to be fair to counsel, uh, it's, it's likely that the insurer has an adjuster uh, who, while perhaps having more experience, may or may not have more experience on damage uh, uh, appraisal, um, they're likely going to rely on experts as well. 
Okay. Carla, thank you everyone for sending in these questions. We have just a couple more. Uh, going back to comments on dwelling uh, total or partial loss dispute, can this be dealt with in the appraisal process, um, part of the value, or is it uh, for the courts to address? Well, that would be a sort of interest. That leads me to um, to comment that the matter of jurisdiction uh, isn't crystal clear what falls in with assessing the value of damages. Uh, there's a you'll find different uh, cases, different decisions in different cases uh, in the court system where courts have said, well, uh, sure, in order to uh, assess the value of a, uh, of a piece of property, you have to de determine whether it has been damaged or not. Um, that makes sense. Uh, others have said, well, uh, it's really not up to the uh, appraisal process to determine whether something is a, a right offer can be repaired. Um, So, um, you know, if you're frank, I'd want to be aware of the, the specifics of that circumstances and do a little research to determine whether or not I felt it fell within our jurisdiction or not. And that would be something that, um, based on the provisions of the appointment, acceptance of appointment document, where I gave myself the, the authority to uh, make decisions as a, as a process, that would be a jurisdictional issue that I would make a decision on for the for the panel okay do you agree that the appraisers are to identify the items in dispute and only if they can't resolve them that is when the umpire gets involved yes yep. short answer how is the agreement of the umpire come to do each appraiser uh, put in a list of list of umpires and then they agree on one of the umpires to put uh, put forth so I guess that's if there's if the appraisers have different uh, different ideas of who they want to have as the umpire. Is there a process um, for that? There's no fixed process, um, but generally what happens is uh, the insurer names someone, the uh, homeowner names someone. They tell each other uh, who they've named, or um, the appraiser, the, the insurance company tells the appraiser to contact, sorry, the adjuster to contact uh, the homeowner. The homeowner tells the, uh, the uh, adjuster who they've appointed. Anyway, so in one way or another, they make contact with each other and they just suggest names. Simple as that. And uh, hopefully they agree on a name. And uh, if they if they don't, uh, then the court's there to uh, appoint. But that's, that's pretty rare, especially in Ottawa. Um, it's um, a pretty, uh, it's not a huge community of uh, people involved in these uh, who act as appraisers and umpires so uh, uh, the names suggested will be familiar to each other and uh, they can uh, usually uh, agree on somebody i think i've been appointed once in all the other cases i have been it's been agreed upon by the appraisers Okay. Uh, appraisals are sometimes triggered following an interim proof of loss, which doesn't resolve the claim. Is there anything to prevent this or, or recommend a final proof of loss? So give me that again, Keith. Appraisals are sometimes triggered following an interim proof of loss, which doesn't resolve the claim. Is there anything to prevent this or, or recommend a final proof of loss? Um, well, hmm. I, I think if I was a homeowner who didn't want it to be triggered, I'd be taking the position that the um, proof of loss to be that there was referred to in section one in 148 is the uh, full proof of loss. Um, and in fact, in the um, Campbell case, that was one of the um, one of the issues, the um, homeowners didn't provide a proof of loss because they were saying, we're not going to provide an interim one because we're going to be bound by that uh, or we'll have to be fighting against the numbers in the interim proof of loss. Uh, we're going to wait um, till we have, uh, in fact, the, the home 
built instead of doing it on the basis of uh, of bids uh, or quotes they were going to wait for the home to be built and then put those numbers in because they know they're aware of how how important the numbers are and the court found that that's reasonable and that could slow the process up in a huge way Okay, uh, as we get towards the top of the hour, why don't we just um, finish off with, with one final question. And Steve, would you, maybe just to, to help illustrate all this, could you just share a couple of examples of some of the natures of the cases you've been involved with recently? Um, recently, I've had a number of cases uh, arising from uh, damage to homes uh, through the uh, volcanoes and sec sorry, volcanoes, tornadoes in... Um, uh, Have you been to Iceland? Yes, yeah, a volcano that would be that would be different. So a number of uh, cases arising from the uh, tornadoes in 2018. I've had a uh, fire loss uh, on a home where uh, arson was alleged. Um, I've had a uh, recently had a water damage uh, uh, to a commercial um, building. Uh, that claim and uh, fire damage to a commercial building. Of course, of course, I've been uh, in my own head thinking about uh, uh, residential losses, but of course it would apply equally to uh, commercial losses. Yes, yes. It, it, a, good, a good point, at least for me, is the layperson on the call. Well, we're wrapping up now. Uh, we've had so many questions in. I uh, really appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to, to submit those. We hope uh, all the information passed on uh, in the Q&A and in the, uh, the presentation itself was of value. Uh, as mentioned, uh, hang, uh, uh, watch your inbox this afternoon and we'll have a copy of the slides as well as those uh, two sample documents that Steve mentioned. Uh, we'll have those included in that email coming out this afternoon. A, a recording of the presentation will be online uh, on the Kelly Santini website uh, within the next 24 hours. If you know anyone who you think would uh, benefit from this material and presentation, uh, please feel free, of course, to, to share that with them. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending. And of course, uh, thank you, Steve, for uh, taking the time to share the mysteries of the property appraisal process. Now, And we're glad that they have now been explained. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon, everyone.